The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode 118. One day, I shall come back. That's it. I've been renewed. It's when a Time Lord's body wears out, he regenerates. I'm a Time Lord. I'm not a human being. I walk in eternity. Brave hearty. Change, my dear. And it seems on a moment too soon. Unlimited vice pudding! Position, that's wearing a bit thin. Fantastic. Allons-y! I am Scottish. I can complain about things. Ta-da! She'll be fine. Hi, I'm Don Bethanelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the fifth Doctor story, Peter Davidson's uh, era. Uh, it's called Kinda, not Kinda, Kinda, as I, the mistake I originally made. To, joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? So... <laughs> Kinda is a four-part episode from February of 1982, featuring Peter Davidson as the Fifth Doctor, and uh, his companions in this episode are Adric, Tegan, and no, <laughs> yeah. well, sort of, sort of. So Nissa is, ep- is absent. Yeah, this episode was written when they were only planning to have two companions, and so rather than completely rewrite it. Um, because both Adric and Tegan have significant roles, and rather than split one of those roles in half, they just provided Nyssa in a frame sequence. So she's in the first and the last scene, but spends most of the episode uh, sleeping off um, whatever happened to her that caused her <laughs> to collapse at the end of the previous episode. Yeah. It's like, she'll she'll be fine. She just needs to sleep for basically four episodes yeah. <laughs> there's a very well, I, 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 very thin uh justification for it but yes <laughs> I, I i wondered if uh you know janet fielding and sarah sutton were both owed some time off because tegan although she does play an important part in this episode she's she's basically gone for one of the parts she's sleeping for one of the parts you yeah. don't really see her so yeah. i wonder if she was owed a little bit of time off as well <laughs> and and just dis- despite that this is one of janet fielding's this is like her favorite script of all of the Doctor Who TV shows she did, this is her favorite because she gets is, to be bad. I was going to say, which is ironic because looking at uh, the TARDIS Wikia, it's one of the least favorite episodes of fans. Yeah, although although not as least liked over time. Uh, initially, fans did not like it at all. And then over time, it's gotten a little better, but still not a, not a great episode. Uh, it, not a great it, episode. It, it's interesting. It did get a sequel, though. Um, mm-hmm. It was uh, popular enough with the showrunners, at least, that they they did a sequel called Snake Dance a few seasons later. Um, it's also interesting what actors like and what viewers like is not always the same. Um, Majel Barrett Roddenberry's one of her favorite episodes of the original series was And the Children Shall Lead because it had like her kids in it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that would be your favorite. I, I will give her you know that. That's fine. Uh, nobody else liked it, but that's OK. <laughs> so um yeah and the so Tegan is the the we start off with Tegan going to take a nap a two day long nap and the doctor creates a, a delta wave generator using the sonic screwdriver which means the sonic screwdriver is no longer available uh, for and, the rest of the show. <laughs> and in fact it's going to be destroyed in the next story anyway. They were wanting to get away from using the sonic screwdriver in this era. Okay. Uh, which is interesting at uh, how very different we are in the modern <laughs> new who era where it's, it's a key and, and element. They didn't use it anywhere near as much as they use it today. I yeah. mean, it, it wasn't yeah. quite as ubiquitous as you see it now. It well, and one wand. of the, one of the reasons for that is because the episodes have to be short and self-contained now. And so they need to move the plot faster. And that's one thing the sonic screwdriver does is move the plot mm-hmm. faster. Yes. Yes. So let's talk about the, the, the background for the story, the, the, the story itself, which is based on, Buddhist ideas, the Buddhist religion. Yeah, ish. <laughs> ish, right. Uh, like uh, the names and a lot of the themes are kind of Buddhist. Uh, the The name of the planet is Deva Loka, which means realm of the gods. The mm-hmm. The name of the Mara comes from a from a demon of the same name in Buddhist mythology. 
Uh, Kinda, Duka, Pana, Karuna, Anada, Anika, Anika. Those are all Buddhist concepts and so on and so forth. Yeah. So there's a lot of like, that. Like the guy who who possesses um, Tegan Te- is, yeah. is, mm-hmm. is Dukkha, and that means suffering, which is a key concept in Buddhism. You desire leads to suffering, and so the way to get out of suffering is to extinguish all desire and achieve nirvana. Also, though, even though, and one of the reasons why there are Buddhist themes in this is because one of the show producers, I believe it was Barry Letts, was Buddhist, um, and they kind of put some of that in as kind of a nod to him. But there's also prominent Christian themes in this. I mean, we have this garden paradise planet with apples and snakes and women offering apples to people. And it's okay. We could not get too much more garden of Eden if we tried. Right. I was going to say that. And then there's a a third level at which it's sort of similar to the, you know, we're referencing a history similar to that of the Australian colonization and Aboriginal peoples and their own concepts, uh, you know, the cosmology, you know, how the universe works and, how time is is circular and that sort of thing. So there, it works on several different levels. Um, yeah, the it, it, it's really clear that we have a parody or satire of the British Empire here. And oh, yeah. according to some people, specifically Australia, which also may have been one of the things Janet Fielding liked about it. Um, but like one of the concepts that Australian Aborigines um, have is a special significance for dreams. And dreaming plays a big role in this as well. Right, right. That's true. Right. The, 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 like, in fact, uh, I don't want to. I don't want you know uh, uh, misspeak about Aboriginal the way of thinking. You know, the, the way they see the world. But I heard some something is similar to they don't make a distinction between the dream world and 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 the waking world and that sort of thing. I may be wrong on that, so I don't want to go too far with that. Well, but. this might be something we'll have to toss over to our friends at the Catholic of Oz pause. Catholics of God, Oz podcast <laughs> right, to, yeah. to help Thank us with. Sorry, I'm trying to spit it out. I'm not doing well. But <laughs> yeah. Toss it over to that our our brother our, our fellow podcast uh, here on SQPN from yep. our Australian friends and see if they can uh, help us out with that. Yeah, that would be great. I would love to hear uh, some feedback from them on that. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, play it in the next show if we get that. So uh, what we have is so we have this this garden like planet, this paradise. Um, where there are no predators, there are, there is no aggressiveness, there's no fighting, and there's an abundance of food, no disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know the drill. And we have an expedition of advanced humans. The the, the noble savage myth, uh, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And then we have an expedition of advanced humans who are among the kinda, um, and some of these humans have gone missing. We have a a, 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 a leader of the expedition who is sort of a, a almost a, a caricature. Of the you know, the the British Colonel of Regiment uh, of Infantry Regiment and all that sort of thing, you I'm know, he's... model model the modern Major General <laughs> with yes. a, with a pith helmet and everything. Um, he's interesting because in, when we first meet him, he's like playing a practical joke on the more uptight younger guy. Um, and and the fact he 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 does play a practical joke, and it's like, dude, it's just a joke. Um. It shows a nice side of him. And then he kind of goes crazy, as does the younger guy. And then by the end of the whole story, they've had their minds restored. And even though they're they're imperialists, they're 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 not shown as just being relentlessly evil people. Right. And I should note that the actor who plays um this guy, um he plays Sanders. Uh, is Richard Todd, who's a, a famous British actor, uh, Oscar nominated, well known uh um, not only for a movie that from 1949, so you know, uh, w- well, well in the past, but uh, it, he was also in the Longest Day, the the uh, the movie about the Normandy landings, the D-Day landings. Uh, so uh, I thought I recognized him from somewhere, and I think I recognized him from that. I think he played um, General Montgomery in that, but uh, it, you don't hold me to that. I have to, I'd have to look it up. But uh, so we have this ex- expedition. Um, they, some of the members of the expedition are missing. And meanwhile, the expedition has, they've taken some of the Kenda hostage as standard procedure. And I'm like, wow, that it's just like sort of, I mean, I, I know we're supposed to be kind of shocked by that, you know, that, that this, uh, this idea, this is standard procedure, but it, it's so matter of fact. And the doctor is shocked by that as well. When, when he hears about this, 
he shouldn't be shocked. That actually was standard. I, mean, I don't know about the British Empire, but um, but in in Roman history, that was standard procedure. Um, one of the ways you secured good relations with other nations, if you were Romans, was you took some of their upper caste as hostages. So you'd like get the princes and bring them to Rome and you'd educate them as Romans there. And then when they were adults, you'd send them back and get the new group of people to come over as hostages. So at any time, if they start rebelling against you, you can deal with the hostages. Although the hostages were treated with, like, they were essentially free in the place that they were in hostages. Rome. Yeah. In Rome, right? they were not kept in a cell or that sort of thing. But uh, so a little different. But yeah, I, I guess what you're saying. Uh, and and I mean, it was, go ahead. There's cases where it was less in, in history that it was less, uh, uh, nice, shall we say, uh, you, you think back in the, the, you know, going back to the, the Israelite nation, you know, go back to when they were conquered by the Babylonian Empire and the Assyrians, that so many of them were taken into what they call the diaspora, where they were taken out of their homeland, what we modern day, modern day Israel, you know, to to be dispersed among the, the conquering nations. So, I mean, that that was a very much a historical thing. Right, right. And, and so and this expedition is on this planet because they're they're. They're checking to see if it's suitable for colonization on their overpopulated home planet. So that's that's sort of the, the that's the base you know frame for this story. Uh, meanwhile, the doctor and the companions are exploring the forest, and they find this musical structure hanging from the trees, uh, where Tegan crystal starts, chimes. Yep, yeah, and and Tegan starts playing with it, and it makes her sleepy, and she takes a nap while the doctor and Adric <laughs> wander off. Uh, well, and, I love it. They just kind of leave her lay there. Oh, she'll be fine. Yeah, on this on this strange let's not, planet. Not, let's get her back to the TARDIS. Not, you know, we, we might want to find some place better. It's like, oh, she'll be fine right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Adric finds an armored suit that's uh, a unoccupied. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, a, a big cardboard one. And uh, he meddles with it, and it captures him and the doctor, because, you know, Adric. And uh, meanwhile, Tegan's visited by some natives while she's sleeping, and then they wander away again. Um, they, they just they leave wandering. offerings to her. Right. And uh, so the doctor um, encounters the advanced humans that the, the armored suit brings them back to the, the dome where these advanced humans are living and encourages them to uh, give him the benefit of the doubt until they have reason to think he's hostile. You know, they assume Sanders assumes he's a hostile creature. And uh, he's like, why? Why do you just assume? It's actually an interesting moment there. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, Tegan has this kind of mystical interior dream. experience, this dream. And, and encounters some weird beings who think that she's an illusion. And then she meets this trickster sort of fellow. And they Duca. all have, what's his name? Duca. Duca, Suffering. right. Yeah. Right. Uh, and they all have a snake tattoo prominently on their arm, which is yeah, significant. Yeah, and this is a, re I really like this this sequence. It, it stretches, you know, over a couple episodes because what Duca is trying to do is confuse Tegan and let him possess her physical form in the real world. And and so this is a very creepy sequence. Um, the realm she's in is dark, but they've oversaturated the light so that all the figures, they're against a black background, but all of the figures are like glowingly brilliant white in this creepy way with it generates unnatural colors. And they're they're wearing these kind of old fashioned costumes and they have the snake tattoos and 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 Duca is talking to Tegan in a really creepy way. He's saying things like, you will agree to be me sooner or later, this side of madness or the other. <laughs> and and then he starts to drive her mad and he like creates a duplicate of her. Um, so you have two Tegans talking to each other. And at first it's, it's like, I'm thinking, okay, well, if I'm the real Tegan, I'm going to instantly know that the other is, is an illusion. But then as it, as the sequence progresses and we come back to it, Tegan has gotten confused and she's not sure which of her is real anymore. And, and that's like very disturbing from an identity viewpoint. It's like, which one of me is the real one? I can't tell anymore. And then he, then Duca creates like dozens of her to confuse her even more. And it's, I thought it was a very effectively realized series sequence. Yes. It uh, appropriately creepy and, uh, in, in a little bit like, uh, you know, 
jangly. It's, it's weird, you know, and and so the, it it it's appropriate to the to the story. Um, I mean, I kind I, I kind of like into one heck of a a drug trip, but it was. <laughs> I mean, it it definitely did, did the the effect of you know getting her opened, you know, suge- getting that suggestion, getting her opened to being taken over. Right, and in, in fact, you know, the we she eventually does uh, 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 allow it just so that she can escape from this weird realm. Uh, and and at that point, when she wakes up and she's now Amara and she now has a snake tattoo in the real world, she also has swished red food coloring around in her mouth to make her teeth red, <laughs> which is which is nice. I have always thought that on sci fi shows when they, they need to take advantage of food coloring in the mouth more. <laughs> there you go. Why it's does, every, why does the her... inside of everyone's mouth look just like ours? Right. Yeah. Well, she also changed her accent. She went to more of an uh, an English accent while she was possessed. Instead of Australian? That's interesting. Mm-hmm. I yeah. Didn't... Interesting. I didn't notice that. But, you know, in the movies, the people with the British accents, you know, like the Nazis with the British accents, they're the bad guys. Yes. <laughs> right. Or in, in Star so, Wars. So, uh, I was going to say, in, in British-made movies, do the do the uh, the bad guys have American accents? Oh. No, they have German <laughs> accents. So, uh... German. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, in... Uh... It, it, we have this uh, the kinda. We have to talk about the kinda here. They They're wear the natives, the natives, and they wear wear a, like a necklace that looks like DNA, and it's and it's noted. But that's all. It's is noted. It's just noted. There's no re- real reason given for why they wear. Like why it's significant that this necklace looks like DNA, or what's the purpose, or. It's just sort of like, oh, they're more than they seem. They wear DNA necklaces. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's, okay. it's, it's kind of hinted that they're more than the noble savages. That there, there is a you know a level of intellect there that uh, and, might equal or surpass the advanced conquerors. Right. And, and they, you know, they have some kind of advanced technology. They built the crystal wind chimes, and they, uh, they, they, they are apparently telepathic. In fact, none of the men in their in their group can speak under ordinary circumstances. Right, uh, and and uh, the technology might be. We, we find out later that they have a cyclical time that they're they're caught in a cycle of of um, of time where they're at the beginning of that cycle where they're primitives. But we we're given kind of given this idea that they advance and then go back to the beginning again. They're caught in this sort of loop. Because of the Mara, which is these these beings with the snake tattoos, uh, so so we're we're supposed to believe that they're that sort of like Battlestar Galactica that they keep going through these cycles of advancement and then back to the beginning. Um, so the these the the people from this I can, I can never remember, I don't know if we got a name for these these advanced humans what their world was. Um, we'll and, just call them the humans as opposed to the Kenda. I'll do that. Yes. Yeah, so the humans. They're not supposed to eat the local produce, and when caught, the doctor hands over this apple that that he's eaten and and says, uh, "An apple a day keeps the uh oh, never mind." <laughs> like, <I> love- <laughs> that was good. That was a good line. Uh, yes, the maybe we shouldn't be uh, talking about keeping the doctor away. <clears throat> uh, we also start to get more craziness on the part of the of the humans. Um, Hindle, that's the younger guy becomes emotionally unstable he throws a tantrum he breaks stuff he's going mummy make him go away and it becomes progressively more theater of the absurd with this guy meanwhile the older uh, guy the commanding officer goes off in the forest and um on an expedition to learn something and he is given a box that the kinda leader who's an old woman named Pana um and by the way the actress who plays Pana is also the actress who played the leader of the sisterhood of Karn in the brain of Morbius really yeah yeah same actress um but uh anyway Pana tells her young assistant whose name I'm forgetting at the moment who's also uh, it's like a teenage girl it uh, tells her it- yeah, it tells her only a woman can can like properly understand this gift. And and but it, the commanding officer gets the gift. It's a box. And when he comes back, he's all smiles and really nice and creepy, crazy. Right. Yeah. The, 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 when it's the, if a man opens the box, he goes crazy. If a woman opens the box, she has this this telepathic gift. Um, 
And uh, so they're surprised when uh, the doctor opens it and looks inside that he doesn't go crazy, which is interesting. Uh, Probably because he's already crazy. And and (laughs) then they're going to betray that because they expose him to the box again and it like fixes them and makes them totally normal and undoes the psychological problems they started with. And they explain (laughs) that the box is a healing device. Well, then why did it drive them crazy the first time? So it doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, as the um, as the military guys are getting crazy, Adric once again turns traitor and <laughs> joins them. Yeah, although he, tra- he he tries to make it seem like I'm I'm joining them in order to stay in their good graces and to help escape. help the doctor. Yeah, yeah, but he tries that like once, and then we get no further indication that. Well, I guess we do. It, it's it's another common Adric thing, though, is he's always the one who's joining the other side. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, Hindle apparently is communicating telepathically with the with the Kinda that uh, that they've had as hostages. He's got some way yeah. of uh, I'm not sure. Like they don't. I'm not sure they actually explain how that worked, except he looked at them in a mirror and it made that and it made them think that he had captured their soul, which was which is a common trope about you know primitive people are so primitive they don't understand that a, a mirror is just a mirror because they never look in water yeah they never looked in water before you know it's like yeah, yeah. it's a common uh trope but 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 i'm not sure where this idea that that he looked in the mirror and he's got telepath telepathy with them came from was, well well there was one point two where they show one of the the natives taking his little dna neck hanging thing and handing it to him and i think that was kind of like their they're symbolizing that connection. Their submission, yeah. Well, so they are telepathic. I mean, that's how they normally communicate. So I, I guess we can he- explain this by saying once he th- made them think he had captured their souls, they became his willing followers and then re- re- understood him telepathically and and did whatever he told them. Yeah, he uh, as, as Hindle takes command and goes a little crazy, uh, I know he, he goes a little Kurtz from Apocalypse Now. <laughs> he has that sort of that crazy uh, military man in the woods. So there's that that whole this, that whole thing where you know the, I gotta see Hindle, the guy who plays Hindle. He does a good job of of play of playing up this uh, slowly going mad and getting crazy and crazier as we go through. Going crazy and then almost almost becoming like a child. Yes. Yeah. He, he, does, 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 throws a, he th- literally throws a temper tantrum that people don't want to play with him. Yeah. Oh, and later it, it's they make it explicit that he and the commanding officer have like reverted to childhood because now they're they're building forts and they're making paper dolls and they're yeah. making pretend cities and stuff like that. <laughs> now, there's a third member of this expedition that we see, which is uh, Todd. She's the uh, Dr. Todd, uh, a scientist who is you know on the doctor's side of things and she, she wants to see things logically and, and whatnot. And and she she's been trying to get the expedition to understand the kinda are not the the backwards natives you think they are. There's more going on here than you than you think. There's more to this planet than you think. Um, and hadn't been listened to. Uh, and so finally she has the doctor to kind of to kind of take her side. Uh, but uh, so she's sort of our our viewpoint character into this the, this human expedition, which is yeah. uh, interesting. And, then, and she's she's the one to illustrate her fundamental goodness. She's the one at the end that reports that their their final report to their home planet is going to say this this planet is totally unsuitable for colonization. So the Kindle Kinda are going to be OK. Right. Uh, now, um, Hindle intends to burn everything within a diameter of 50 miles around the dome as a defense against the trees and plants. Uh, he believes that the, uh, the plants are hostile to him. Um, uh Meanwhile, uh, let's see, the the trickster, uh, after a whole day and night of <laughs> Deegan sitting staring into space in this uh, uh, this, this clearing, the trickster uh, possesses her and and she's now um, wandering Amara. around. Yeah, she's now mm-hmm. the Mara. And then, but pretty quickly, the Mara transfers over to one of the natives named Aris. Yeah, so she's like sitting in a tree being all sexy possessed and starts lobbing apples at this innocent Kenda guy who we later learn is Eris. More Garden of Eden symbolism, by the way. Yeah, it's like (laughs) this is totally, totally Garden of Eden. And then she like seduces him, 
spiritually and he becomes a Mara and gets the snake tattoo and she just goes to sleep. Right. Uh, for basically the rest of the episode. Yes. Then we find out that the um that the, the what's in the box that made Saunders go crazy is a, a it's actually one of those jack in the box things where the snake pops out, which is yeah. kind, kind of ironic given what's coming up <laughs> later in the episode. Well, it's not a snake. It's like a little figure. It's like a primitive little fetish figure or something. Oh, but right. That's what it is. Yeah. But it is nice to have, like, they have all the buildup with the cliffhanger and the box. And then when it finally opens, it's a jack in the box. <laughs> yes. Well, it not, it not <laughs> like the buildup, right to like Todd screaming as they go, as they uh, fade to black on it. <laughs> yep. But, you know, but it, it's got that little pop pop-up thing but then there's more there's something more in the box because yeah. all everybody who looks into it suddenly their face starts glowing yeah and the doctor and dr todd have a vision of the kinda summoning them and they like see the world through the kinda's perspective which is apparently what the box is meant to do is let you have the kinda's perspective but only a woman can understand it and so like what's with all the sexism in this episode I know. Why <laughs> sexist against all the guys here, or at least with the yeah, doctor? I, well, well, I maybe mean, the when, doctor's when, been a woman before. Maybe that's what it is. When <laughs> when Pana finally meets the doctor, she's she's amazed that he looked into the, the into the box and says, "What are you, a fool?" And and he's like, "Well, I suppose so. You fool, you blind male fool." <laughs> it's like, Call you an idiot all the time, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. And I actually like that he, he just plays along with that. He doesn't he doesn't let it give he, he, he doesn't give her any rise. You know, this is this is one of these episodes. I, you know, of course, I've mentioned that you know, Peter Davison is one of my favorite doctors, and this is one of the episodes I think that really shows off because his his facial expressions and not so much the words, but just his the, his looks are just so perfect. You know, because he, he'll he'll just have this flash of annoyance and just kind of okay, whatever. Yeah, they go to the cave where Pana is, and they get this. Uh, they go on a uh, a vision quest. Uh, well, before that, they meet the trickster um, and the jester. So the there's a the tribe of Kinda have the, this jester figure who apparently the, the the Kinda are quite funny and they they love a good laugh and the doctor does a magic trick and pulls a coin out of his ear and and makes him all, all excited about that then they and, and Doctor Todd explains the function of the jester is to defuse tense social situations so we see him trying to do that repeatedly yes uh and and in the face of the morrow in inside Aris. Uh, who shows up and speaking and shocks everyone because he's he's a, a male who speaks and uh, and he wants them to attack the doctor and they refuse uh, at the instigation of uh, uh, Karuna the girl who who, who takes teenage them, girl the teenage girl who takes them to go see uh, the old woman in the cave where they then go on a vision quest <laughs> so this this trippy yeah, vision yeah, of the, the wheel it, of time. And and part of this is that so because men in, among the Kenda can't speak, it's it, it makes Eris a um a a figure of prophecy. They have this like at the end of the cycle, there's going to be a, a a leader who's a man who can speak, and so everybody's got to obey him. And so he's he like pr he quickly wins over the obedience of the other Kenda. And wants to like attack the dome, which is weird because the two guys in the dome, the two humans there, are planning to blow it up anyway. <laughs> right, everybody's um, working to the same goal. <laughs> yeah, um, but then the uh, Pana, the old woman, lets the doctor and Doctor Todd have a vision where they, and it's really it's another effective vision sequence. It's different than the one that um, that that Tegan had. Here we see like the Kindas. Uh, in the forest, and they're surrounded by this group of pedestals. And on each pedestal, there's a different thing that measures time: a metronome, an hourglass, uh, one of those clocks with the numbers that flip over, a sundial, things like that. And so, this symbol, this circle of timepieces, represents the cycle of time in the Kinda's belief. And stuff starts to break down. Um, uh, Eris is as this prophetic figure is bringing on the end and our cliffhanger is you know the doctor saying it's the end of everything <laughs> and it's very effective and then they come out and they find pana is now dead right it, and in fact has in some way passed into the girl karuna's or her her or at least her her 
in some ways, sort of like the Doctor's Regeneration, where um, you know she's she's a ex- pre-existing person, but Karuna now carries some of the personality and memories and knowledge of Pana. Yeah, they're they're a little ambiguous about this. Is you know is Pana possessing Karuna? That's what it seems like at first, but then they clarify as her knowledge and experience has passed over to Karuna. But then Karuna says, we are one. So it's like there's been some kind of merger. We are the Borg resistance. <laughs> oh, wait, sorry, different yeah. show. Yeah. So Certainly, th- this is one of the weirder Doctor Who episodes of this era or ever. Yeah, yes. So um, the, 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 the Mara t- brings the Kinda to, to the dome to confront the dome where the armored suit is uh, the main defense, apparently. And so the Mara constructs an armored suit out of sticks that he gets inside. Yeah. <laughs> very, very strange. I'm not sure what that's about. It was about. probably about as sturdy as the actual prop that they use for the armored <laughs> yeah. suit. But still. As, speaking of props and, and such in this episode, when they come to the dome, you can very clearly see the concrete studio floor under the leaves they've scattered on top of it. <laughs> I feel for that jester having to do all that tumbling and stuff. Oh, I was oh yeah. Uh, so. Um, Adric, meanwhile, has gotten the into the armored suit and uh, which is b- b- controlled by your mind. And he loses control and starts blasting the poor kid into bits with it because he's freak. He's freaking out, losing control. Um, I have to ask because uh, I've noticed this in several episodes. What's with the star on Adric's oh, shirt? It's a badge for mathematical excellence. He, he It's an award he got as a child. They, 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 did, they did explain it back in the first episode when he when he right. joined. OK, that that. Yeah, that he received that. I and by the way, kind of a kind of a sneak uh, peek for next next time we talk about the fifth doctor. It plays a role. Yeah. In the episode. Oh, yeah. OK. OK. That star is not going to is not going to survive. Not long, and it's, it's, it's not, not going to be the, the only thing that doesn't survive. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> spoilers for the next next uh, Peter Davidson episode. Well, it's very cute that Adric wears his little badge for being a good mathematician uh, all the time. Um, so uh, interesting that Todd, the Doctor Todd, uses reverse psychology on Hindle to open the box uh, finally to to get him to pacify him uh, in some way. Um, and and he's behaving as a child now, so he doesn't catch on that she's using reverse psychology. I noticed. Uh, speaking of um, Adric, at, at one point he, uh, they're all in the in the dome. And he's like a jerk to Tegan, calling her weak and, you know, like, yeah. uh, I'm like, well, wow, you're, yeah, you're such a punk. He should be whacked on the head. Uh, what is the, the, the doctor says, what is the one thing evil cannot face? Uh, he's talking about the, the, his, his eventual solution to this. And he says itself. And I'm like, is that is that true? I, I think so. Yeah. Um, villains never see villains when they look in the mirror. Um, evil is it, it, I mean, there are situations in which someone's going, Oh, I'm so evil and I love it. Right. But, but the snidely it, whiplash type characters. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but that's not how it tends to work. Uh, that's kind of an exception. I mean, people may get a charge out of being naughty or something sometimes, but when you're talking about real fundamental evil, um, people rationalize it. They're not talking about naughtiness, but naughtiness, but it's like if, if someone is sleeping around on their spouse, or killing somebody, or oppressing a people, they don't go, oh, we're so gloriously evil. They they rationalize it as, well, my wife doesn't love me, so I can sleep around, or this person's standing in my way, so I can kill them. Isn't there basically a kind of a, a saying that no one sees themselves as the villains in their own personal story? Right. Yeah. Everyone's the hero of their own story. Uh, and that, uh, so I, you know, I and, can and see you that, can, yeah. And you can think of... of you know, however despicable a person you want in human history, they don't always, they don't see themselves as, oh, I'm an evil person doing an evil thing. They see themselves as the, the savior of their people or the person who's, you know, cleansing this or doing that, or you know, it's fixing, always for some right. good yeah. era. Yeah. And, and it's like thing. the, it's part of the satire of colonialism in this episode is, you know, the, the, the colonialists don't view themselves as harming the natives. They view themselves as doing a perfectly legitimate thing. And so the, the doctor's solution here is um, to get evil to face itself. He's going to use a circle of mirrors made out of spare solar panels to push the Mara out of uh, Aris. 
And so they they get so, him in so here. So no matter no matter where Eris looks, he's going to be confronted with his own image, and it's going to drive the Mara out of him. Right, which it does in the form of the snake tattoo slides giant, off of him. <laughs> yeah, giant well, starts pink as, snake. It starts as a little <laughs> snake, and it grows and grows and grows. Now apparently, you know, it looks bad. It looks like a bad puppet. It, it's, yeah, it's clearly. Apparently, they had problems that cut their production time and didn't leave enough time for a more elaborate special effect that was planned. They were planning, even for this era, it's a pretty bad puppet, <laughs> yeah. frankly. Uh, so I, I, I like, though, I'm going to give this episode any, uh, props for one thing it did in this sequence, because when the snake does grow, Adric says, it's fantastic. Where does it get its, where does it draw its energy from? It's incredible. <laughs> so they ha- finally hang a lantern on the problem of, where do things get mass when they grow rapidly? It's like in the search for Spock, where he goes from being a baby to an adult in a couple hours, he should be stuffing his face with food every <laughs> single moment. Right. You know, or, and even that wouldn't do it. Or all of the air around him should be very cold as he sucks the heat out of it or something, just something. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so the, the big snake puppet uh, eventually, um, is expelled back to the the dark places of the inside as the, that's where uh, uh yeah. where Tegan had been in her dream and sequence all, and all of the kinda applaud yay <laughs> it was nice applause like in a theater it was very nice and and point out too that you know before they did the whole thing with the snake you know they went and got Tegan who was still napping peacefully uh, Nissa. And, oh no no no, no, no. Tegan. Oh, Tegan. Oh, Tegan yes she was still sleeping after two days yeah. and woke her up and was like, where you been? She had no idea that she had even been asleep for two days, for that yeah. long. And, and that she, act- remember, she remembered nothing of it. And that actually plays, uh, although she does eventually remember dropping apples on Eris's head. Um, but the, it, it also plays a role in why is all of this happening now? You know, what caused all of this? And um, according to uh, Pana, I guess, um, the thing that allowed the Mara out of its dark realm was that a door was opened by the dreaming of an unshared mind, meaning a non-telepathic mind. So the Kenda, apparently, because they're telepathic, they've got some kind of resistance to the Mara that doesn't let them out. But when Tegan, a non-telepath, fell asleep here, it uh, it opened a door that let the Mara out. Why it didn't happen previously with the humans, I don't know. Right. And we never do find out what happened to the missing members of the expedition either. Yeah. Also, we never find out what drove Hindle mad in the first place. The doctor just says early on he's nearing a nervous breakdown. Um, Now, I can headcanon this by saying, okay, maybe these guys also not being telepathic had had Ducca banging on their door, mental doors. And and that's what led to this. But they didn't he say could that. Have been, he could have been just unstable to begin with, because I know he talked to, he, at some point he comments about how he was beaten every day by his dad and he see how he turned out. Oh, no, <laughs> yeah. true. Yeah, there was that. You that know, moment. So, I mean, there, there, there could have been some you know mental instability there to begin with. And then the, the presence of the Kinda and the, the Mara and all that could have. And the pressure of the missing the members of the, of the of the expedition. Yeah, I, I did think that was a big hole. There it was like that that question of where where did the those other two guys go, end up? Because uh, the Kinda are, as we established, are peaceful people. They they didn't do it, so who did it? So uh, all right, so that and then we end with the Doctor uh, going back to the TARDIS and uh, uh, Tegan uh, saying, uh, that, "You know, I'm I'm ready to leave. It's all a bit too green for me here." <laughs> the Doctor <laughs> agreeing with her. Um, yeah, the doctor specifically says paradise is a little too green for me as well. And actually, I thought that that captured the doctor's character. He can't ultimately stay in paradise. He has to travel because he's got wanderlust. Right, right. So uh, so that's that's the end of Kinda. And we will return to the Mara in, uh, as you said, in, in a later uh, in a later season episode yep. called Snake Dance. S- right. And there's even they didn't plan it at this point, but there's even a hook in this episode for that where um, after the so when they they drive the Mara out of of Eris, um, Tegan uh, sees this, the giant red, giant pink and red snake puppet and says, that was in my mind. 
And the doctor says, yes, but it's gone now, isn't it, doctor? <laughs> well, not entirely. <laughs> <laughs> we shall see. So, yeah. um, all right. Do, do you guys have any other notes on this uh, you want to share uh, left to, to say? Just uh, is interesting. They they imply that even though the Mara have, uh, even though the Kinda have a cyclical view of time, that that's kind of broken down as a result of this story. Uh, the doctor says they're free of the, or someone I forget who uh, says they're free of the curse of time. It's the Mara that starts the clocks, and and so that's again kind of one of the Buddhist layers of this allegory that desire and things like that are what lead you out of nirvana into the world of time and suffering and so forth. Before we finish up, we'd like to take a moment, as we always do for one of the important things we do, which is to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who. Uh, today, we're thanking uh, by name Charles K, Dr. T, Craig H, Adam C, and Kenneth L. Through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for us to continue the Secrets of Doctor Who, and all the shows we do at sqpn.com. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What did you think of this fifth Doctor story, Kinda? Uh, let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page and leave us some feedback or send us an email to Who at sqpn.com. You can find uh, our show notes at sqpn.com and we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the 10th Doctor story, Human Nature. Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Always glad to be here, and thanks, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest, and remember, there's a difference between serious scientific investigation and meddling, and the Doctor should know that, shouldn't he? Right. This is going to be fun.